All right. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining me. I know that I'm the last thing standing between you and a drink and a fine meal, so I'll endeavor to keep it lively and hopefully you get some real value out of this. Um, so I'm Ron Bodkin. I'm the founder and president of Think Big. Uh, we have been, uh, we're a pure play big data services firm, started the company about six years ago. I was thinking as I was sitting here that it was uh, almost eight years ago that I attended my first Hadoop Summit on campus at Yahoo. And uh, the world of Hadoop has changed a lot in that time, but uh, you know, it's certainly uh, one of the exciting things that honestly I did not envision how important it was gonna be when we started Think Big uh, six years ago was Internet of Things and the use of Hadoop technologies for machine data. So you know, our company, we, we help organizations with all phases of using Hadoop and related ecosystem technologies, planning and architecture, data science and managed services. So I've drawn on a lot of our experience with companies, you know, manufacturers, insurance companies, medical device companies, all kinds of different companies um, that are using Hadoop technologies and, and drawing out some of the patterns that we're seeing, right? So one of the key things is getting value is about collecting the data, managing it to enable analytics. So I'll talk about that. One of the things I think is important, we all hear about big data and the, however many Vs the vendor uh, might be saying, but you know, to me the big thing about big data is really variety, right? That you've got all of these new kinds of data changing faster than ever, they're more complicated than ever. Uh, some of the canonical Internet of Things data sets, sensors we all hear about, but most Internet of Things are smart software devices. And that means they've got logs of lots of interesting things that are happening in the software, and they've got complex configuration. And if they're mobile, they probably have location as some of the key data sets. So even more important than the size of the data is that variety. So let's, let's talk about, you know, well, what are some of the use cases that we tend to see a lot, right? Preventative, predictive maintenance, being able to predict if something's gonna fail, getting information about failure and conditions on a device, being able to search and view detail on some issues or problems that are happening on the fly. When you get a storm of alerts, picking out which ones are actually critical. You know, I think we all have, we've all have experienced this in systems we're working on, where you have s logs that have so many things that could be wrong. You know, you 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 get banner blindness. You can't notice it anymore. So which ones really matter, right? Being able to get down to root cause analysis, have deeper understanding of what's going wrong, understanding usage, even things like uh, product management using connected data, really understand how customers are using your product so you can make them better, right? So those are some example use cases. That just as a little context. With that, let's, let's take a look. You know, in, in the landscape, we, we like to talk about data lakes. And you've probably heard that term a lot. You know, one of the things we all know is that some sense a data lake lets you take all this variety of data and store it in a raw form so you don't have all this overhead in order to make it available. But I think a little bit more going on here, right? So you want to have ways of accessing the data, whether it's search or SQL, or you may be able to pull it into more lab environments to combine it with less well-understood data. But you want to have enough governance in the lake that you acquire data and you're confident you've got complete data. You know that it's there. I'll talk more about that a little bit later. And you want to be able to do just the right amount of things like you know, securing it, you know, being able to, to do a certain amount of cleansing, but still make it easily available for downstream use. So if that's somehow foundational about how we're working with data in the environment, and it certainly is pattern, uh, consistent with other uses, but in IoT use cases, that's common. Um, you know, it's also worth taking another slice and saying, well, let, let's, if you think about it, data, it goes from being fairly raw to being prepared to being published into more of a data product for broader use. Who, who's working with data in these different forms? Right? We've got data scientists want to be able to work with everything, right? all the layers. So even the most raw data as well as stuff that's had a certain amount of profiling and maybe masking of the data. Data modelers, we'll talk a lot more in this talk about data modeling and what does that even mean and, and you know, how can you get value in your IoT scenarios with, with agile modeling. But modelers typically take the acquired data and push it through to use data that can be used by a broader constituency like business analysts, uh, executives, people that want to work with curated data that's well understood and, and you know, willing to accept that there takes more upfront effort to make it useful, right? And then of course, IT needs to touch all these layers. So there's different capabilities for different actors. That's a big part of what's exciting about the big data space is you can let the scientists and, and modelers work with data in more raw forms to better serve the analysts and downstream consumers. So how is data management changing in the, in the IoT space and more generally with Hadoop? So you've probably all heard a bunch about schema on read and there's absolutely a lot of value in schema on read, but 
that's not the whole story. That's step one. You know, the underlying data absolutely has structure, right? I mean, it's not really random bits, even stuff that's unstructured like an image. Well, a GIF, a JPEG, of course, those are well-defined file formats. They're structure. But, but, but this is, it's more about encapsulation. It's like, you may not want to be coupled to the structure. That's really what's going on in Schemon Read is I'm, I'm doing a late binding as to when I want to expose that structure. So, you know, it turns out that there's, that uh, over time you do want to do some uh, schema on write, that you want to parse out some things and have some things that are commonly used and, and curated, right? Just moving to the right, there's still value in this, uh, going from raw to more curated data, but, you know, you could be agile, right? So instead of doing it all up front, and like the, the, the traditional way of parse everything before you have any access to data, you can put the system live with just, uh, just minimum amounts of data structure, and over time, as you discover value, you can promote more structure to make it available, right? Um, the, the nice thing about having this loosely coupled schema is you have more flexibility in your applications, but you know, that does mean you have fewer guarantees from the platform. Things like referential integrity, right? Classically in a database, you can guarantee it. Um, that's an application problem in, in Hadoop in a big data space, especially with multiple tools. There's no way you could enforce something like that, right? So data modeling is far from dead. And I think one of the, one of the pernicious things is people throw out these, these ideas like, oh, you don't need to model your data in just throw it in there. And, and it actually confuses newcomers who think that's true. Right? Anyone who's really worked in Hadoop system knows you spend a lot of time thinking about where you lay things out and partitioning and things like that. Those are data modeling questions. Right? Metadata is more important than ever because you actually have fewer guarantees from the platform. It's even more important to track what's going on in the system. Right? So those are some of the things that are changing in data management. What else? Uh, logically, you know, we think about it, there's a few things I would argue that are really have changed um, in Hadoop versus kind of a classical relational model, right? One is this idea of having JSON-like structures. I think if you're technical, you probably already know what I mean, <laughs> right? There's more complex relations, arrays, maps that, that are, are hierarchical and uh, have more complex structure. Um, it, the, the relational purists used to sort of try to hide that and say, well, let, let's not worry so much about that. See this convoluted re relational structure I can use to model a hierarchy, and it was awful and it didn't represent anything intuitive, right? So we're now embracing JSON like structures are kind of important in the way we think about the world. It is a logical concept. And graphs, the idea that rather than having fixed static relationships, you want to have very dynamic relations in some type of problems. In fact, it comes up quite a bit in IoT, we'll talk about later and the ability to really have a more integrated environment where you can work with you know, large objects, complex specialized data that are more programmatic, that are not general purpose, right? So these are the big elements that I'd say are part of the logical modeling that you need in this space of IoT that, that Hadoop enables. So with that, you know, there, there's a lot of new patterns around how people work with data in Hadoop systems. Um, you know, the, the, the highlighted ones, we, we don't have time to spend you know, to go too deep in any of these. But, you know, the ones highlighted, I will talk a little bit more about now that are very much patterns that we see often coming up in IoT use cases. So let's start with um, the first one, which I, I call event history, right? Which is, in some sense, this is a fact table about common events that occurred in a time series um, that give you an ability to do analytics in a context, right? So you might have information about you know, a wearable device and the events that are going on about those devices over time or telematics, cars driving around. You know, and some of the common things that you see are um, event history. It's typically stored in a columnar format so you can make it really wide and have a variety of things and you still do efficient analytics because you only have to kind of pay for the price of excess of the columns that matter for your analysis. Um, you typically denormalize a fair bit, right? So rather than, you know, the, the mental model that uh, classical database thinking of let's have a star schema or snowflake schema of some sort or a third normal form. Instead, what we're going to do is say, well, let's, let's join in the as was value of the, the dimensional values, right? So if you look at it and say, well, with, with that wearable device, it's connected to an account and, you know, what is the location of, you know, the home location of that account and what's the history and, and, and those type of things, 
you know, rather than just a foreign key to some dimension table, you might keep the foreign key so you have some ability to manage your dimensions and clean them up after there's problems, et cetera, and do analysis compactly. But you probably also include the value of those dimensions. So you really have a more complete set, right? I mean, those who've been working a bit in Hadoop probably know that when you're doing analysis, you want to have these denormalized tables. Uh, you don't pay much for it because it's columnar, so you tend to only query the data you need, and it compresses really well in a columnar format. And um, it's a lot more efficient than trying to, to have your analyses have the complexity of doing multi-way joints to pull in these various data sets, right? Now, th th you'll notice that there's always some things you tend to have in event history. So you'll tend to have an event ID, which is a unique key that represents um, the specific event. Um, typically, you'll have uh, an identifier for some kind of an actor, uh, which could be, could be the device ID. Um, you know, and you'll typically have a timestamp, right? So there's always some amount of structured data that you're, you're gonna have, um, but you may also have a lot of extension data, which could be variable that um, you, may, you may not want to parse out into well-defined event columns, right? Some columns may be critical for analysis and you do wanna parse out, but you'll have others that you will carry from the true raw form into the event history view on the data, which uh, which can, can be in JSON or can be you know, a map or any number of other storage formats. The point being that you know, this is the stuff that you're, that you're leaving in schema on read form in some sense. You're not structuring it yet, but you want to have it available. So if you want to do a, a query to do an analysis of you know, some JSON fields that are in the log with a device and say, is this, is this information interesting? You can get to it with you know, one hive query away, even if it's not part of your wheelhouse analysis. Right? And this is typically partitioned by buckets of time. It can also have secondary partitioning or bucketing uh, schemes. But you know, this is sort of the workhorse, a uh, very common pattern for laying out views on the data in your IoT application. Right? So event history is a common one you see over and over again. It's not just used in IoT. Right? It's also used a lot in consumer behavior analytics, because it turns out that there's a lot of applications where you have continuous flows, continuous applications in, in Hadoop, and you want to organize the data in a way to make it easy to, to do analysis on it. A another one that's really common is the timeline pattern, which is sort of a pivot, right? So instead of putting the, the dominant form of event history is partitioned on, e on time epochs of events, this one is instead partitioned primarily on the device or the actor in general, and um, instead, in some form or another, there's some variants on how to do this, you have all the events and associated cached values around those actors together, right? And th there's different ways of working with this. Um, you have, uh, in systems where this is primarily being done in batch, you may have it as really wide columns or arrays in columns. In systems that are more real-time, it well, may well be done in HBase, and you may actually see that in, you have it instead have uh, the primary key is the the ID of the actor, the secondary key is the uh, timestamp of the event or the event ID, and then you have you know, a whole a, a range of rows co-located for the actor so that you get the same data kind of in, as a secondary set of rows that are bunched together. But either way, the, this, the timeline history makes it really easy to, to, to look at data about a single actor at a time. Oh, the, another variant is you may actually have a hierarchy of actors. So rather than a single you know, actor, if you have a, a, an assembly, right, you've got a cluster and a device and a component, um, there's some types of analysis where it's really helpful to be able to scan the whole cluster together really efficiently. So you can have that kind of hierarchical layout of your key as well. Um, so the, the, the notion then is, this lets you do a lot of work on specific items. It, it comes up in cases like if you want to look at, I mean, as the name timeline implies, right? It's inspired by Facebook's timeline, right? You look at this, all, the, all the events for you, right? For, or, or a friend of yours, right? So in the same way, hey, if I have a support call for my device and I wanna know what's been happening on this device, well, this timeline will tell me things like, oh, well, it just had this alert and this configuration change just happened and so forth. So it makes it easy to provide that kind of a view for support, but it's also useful for things like if you wanna go in and uh, do some training on a model, you can, you can have you know, the long-lived history of the actor. If you wanna do things like look back and try to do some root cause analysis and attribute what, what, what factors uh, led to a problem, right? it could be useful for that as well. Right? So 
So this is a, a, a complementary way. Often you'll see systems where you actually will maintain both an event history view of data and a timeline view of data to serve different use cases in IoT. Another uh, pattern for modeling that we see happen a lot is what I call the network pattern, right? Where a lot of times when you think of uh, IoT, sometimes the most important thing isn't you know, the, the time series of events, but it's actually the overall assembly a configuration, right? So you have different parts that come together, or related items, you know, e even uh, a lot of times you'll see that deployment of something, the, the software components are relevant, right? So when you're dealing with those kinds of configurations, um, it's really natural to have a kind of graph structure, maybe current relations, maybe also historical information. Um, you can use the links in that graph to go and pull um, a little bit more of the full context of, of what's going on from the event history or timeline view, right? So you, could, you can have a compact way of representing all these dynamic new relations, right? Hey, we just, we just added a new kind of item, right? So we can have a new relation, a new type of part that we're including in our device. Um, make it easy to navigate in the network, right? So we can go in and do queries over things like, uh, for example, uh, I want to know that if I think, you know, certain, certain processes in, in my manufacturing created a problem, well, I want to be able to then do traceability in that network graph to say, well, what are all the final assemblies that actually came from parts from that batch, right? That's an example where a powerful graph technology could really help us. Um, you know, make it easier to do that kind of analysis to figure out if there was a problem, you know, what, what it affected, right? So, you know, th this serves actually a range. So that, that's an example of a kind of search, but you can get to which the transitive closure, you know, to more complex analysis. You might run over the graph, you know, computing derived values in the graph, right? So graph is, is powerful. The other thing that you see is that Typically, in, in this kind of a scenario, IoT, you know, if you have long-lived assemblies, over time they change, right? So you want to be able to incorporate information about, you know, a new part, a replacement, an upgrade, and go in and update the graph. So in a sense, maintaining this graph for ongoing analytics is really important, and it's not nearly as time-oriented, right? The f how old the parts are is less important than sort of the relation to the whole. So it represents a very different view of how you work with the data. Um, and you know, there's some different technologies. You know, th some of them, uh, like Giraffe and GraphX and the recent GraphFrame and Spark, are you know, natural to run on top of Hadoop. But then there's also a lot of work on more specialized graph databases, many of which are open source, that really are kind of complementary but in a different environment than Hadoop. So like Blaze, Graph, you know, TitanDB, Neo4j are some of the ones there. So there's some different technologies for that. A little bit of a different pattern. Those three represent different ways of, of laying out the data, different common patterns for, for modeling data in an IoT application. If we look at uh, another key thing is uh, any IoT application uh, is by definition going to be a distributed system, right? So you're going to have um, lots of part things out in the world that are uh, interesting to you, that have state, that, that use a network to connect. And so uh, inevitably, any distributed system, you're going to have to deal with uh, the CAP theorem, right? You're going to have to deal with uh, the, the possibility that you may have uh, partitions in the network and won't have access to the data, you want to know, uh, you won't know the, the current version of state. So, so you, you end up with a lot of interesting problems in, in that space, right? So the, the, the basic thing is this notion of late data, right? That um, even in a distributed system where you've got, you know, data centers where you've got high quality WAN connections, you're still going to have occasional outages and delays in collecting data. But when you get to IoT, it's endemic, right? It, it's very common that mobile devices or, or you know, traveling equipment, you know, trains rolling on tracks, th th their data may be delayed by seconds, minutes, it may even be hours, right? That there could be a good reason that they won't be online. So you have to expect uh, intermittent connectivity, upstream failures, maybe even you know, lack of connectivity will drive to late arriving data. So this chart, 
sort of shows, you know, you can have different curves that show over time, you know, over how long do you wait until you get a given fraction of data in a system like this. So, you know, you can do a kind of statistical analysis to say, um, you know, how much data do we expect to see at a given time, you know, looking at history. So, you know, like in a mobile application, you might find that you, you will have received 99.9% .9 of the data within one minute of the time that it occurs, right? Now, in other applications, like if you're dealing with um, transportation, you, you might find that you have to wait six hours to get 99.9% .9 of the data until you have enough connectivity to receive data from remote things that may be you know, out of coverage areas, right? But you can, you can take a look at those kinds of distributions and you can use that to do what's called a watermark, which is to say, we want to know um, if we think we've received pretty much all the data or all the data in the system so we have enough information to process effectively. You know, th this is a real important thing. I think a lot of times people working on IoT applications have a mental model of the batch feed, which is you know, the data arrives for a time period and it's all there or none, right? Well, th that's not the case here, right? So uh, you, you, know, you have to have an explicit model to think about the late arriving data to say, you know, when do I have enough data that I can usefully process and produce an, uh, some kind of output, right? So you need to have some kind of lineage tracking, know where the data came from and what you've processed. And there's a variety of techniques for watermarking. In addition to the kind of statistical technique to say, well, you know, typically we see this amount of data after this time, so we'll have, you know, do one standard deviation away and say we should really have all the data that we care about or a sufficient amount of data to get going and produce a useful result. You may also have, in systems where there's more connectivity, you may have some kind of controls like heartbeats. So once in a while, you'll, you, you'll see at the start of a period, you know, all oh, these are the things and you, you'll know, here are, all the, here are all the devices I want to hear from. And so you could actually count it up and say, well, I've, I've heard 997 of the 1,000 devices, so I pass a 99% threshold, for example. Right, so watermarks let you say, do I have enough data to, to usefully process or do I need to hold I don't have enough data? Um, you can also have the concept of triggering your calculations your, 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 uh, so that you can have, on, you know, on time means you've received the amount of data that you think you're going to need so you can go ahead. Early is sometimes, especially, you know, if you have long delays in collecting data, it's useful to give intermittent results, right? You might say, look, we don't, think, we don't know we have all the data for the last hour, but we've got enough that we're going to give you our first estimate. So we're going to calculate the estimate, and then we'll calculate it again later on. We'll, we'll update our, our uh, view you know, on, uh, for example, you know, capacity in the network or, or you know, you, um, energy consumption uh, once we have more complete data. This is a little bit like uh, when uh, we get economic statistics from the government. They give an initial estimate of the quarter and then you know, they give us a more accurate number later on, right? So, so you could trigger um, your calculation early so you have some kind of an estimate, then on time when your watermark says it's done, but then sometimes you may discover something's wrong, right? Like you have a, a significant problem with your network or a data center or, or you know, a significant lag and a whole bunch of data arrives after you thought you were done. And you may actually have to go back and you know, have a policy then of what do we do if there's a lot of late data? Um, you know, you, you always want to at least know how much it is so you can quantify, but sometimes you, need, you may need to have a business rule to say, well, let's go back and intervene and you know, have an exception to restate something based on having that much late data. So that's, that's the late data pattern. So with that, let, let me segue into a little bit more of a case study of an example of, you know, an IoT uh, use case customer we've been working with for a couple years. Um, so this is a global manufacturer of storage devices of various kinds. Um, you know, they produce hundreds of millions of devices, each of which has many complex components, some of which they manufacture themselves and locations scattered around the globe, a number of which come from specialized suppliers. Um, they do a lot of testing, and uh, the, the tests, as we'll talk about, are complex, and they generate you know, up to a gigabyte of data for each device during its life cycle. Right? And so they have a whole range of different kinds of devices. So with that, some of the challenges when they got started on this journey of applying Hadoop to this problem was, you know, uh, uh, their engineers would spend a lot of time just trying to track down data sets for their products. You know, they called it playing Where's Waldo, right, or data search parties there, where, you know, for any given failure, you, you, you'd try to say, 
where is the test data from that batch from three months ago, right? Maybe if you're lucky, it's in the plant in Singapore and you can have somebody there look it up and get it for you. Maybe it's been, God forbid, archived off the tape and now it's a real process to try to find the tape and restore it and have a look, right? So you would have you know, specialist engineers um, spending a lot of time trying to run down data sets. You know, a big part of this, like in any high-tech industry, uh, products have a short life cycle, you know, measured in quarters, not, not many years. So the faster you can get products uh, working and able to manufacture them at scale, the more value to the business, right? So get, speeding up the cycle time, getting products to market sooner is a big impact to their business. And customers were demanding faster failure analysis. What's wrong? Why did this one thing break? You know, the, the, the response increasingly is, if I detect, if there's a failure in one of these items and you can't tell me why it failed, I'm gonna return the whole batch you shipped me and assume they're all, you know, not useful, right? So, um, you know, big motivation to improve. Technically, underlying this were, you know, a lot of siloing. Separate data across each manufacturing facility that didn't work together. This was exacerbated by, you know, the company had grown, as many organizations have, through a series of acquisitions and had further inconsistencies because of that. You know, the current uh, data warehouses uh, were not scaling well and weren't able to keep up with the volume. And they had a lot of challenges. We'll talk more about exposing binary and other file types. And they didn't really have a consistent platform for doing analytics. A lot of siloing, not just the data, but the analytics approaches, both across locations and by department. So with that, the goal was to expose the entire DNA of the device. The development of it, the, man, the, the quality testing, reliability testing, manufacturing, uh, as well as the live behavior. Once it had been you know, created, then as it was out in the wild and collecting data and interacting, you know, correlating both that DNA and living data to increase operational efficiency and quality. That was the CIO's key goal, working closely with the business users. So to do that, uh, we, we worked with the customer to create um, a Hadoop deployment in the cloud, in this case, um, where lots of different sources coming from different shop floor sites are collected, as well as final assembly data, you know, customer you know, living data for what's going on in the field um, as these devices are being used, various parts suppliers and you know, shipment data. You know, assemb you know, the, the assembly data includes you know, SAP data for all the configurations of how it works. And the approach is to have the raw, the raw extracts of data, but then it, it gets enriched into end-to-end -end views um, you know, of the forms we've been talking about, you know, network view and, and views around, uh, around the timeline of information. Um, there is, uh, you know, a, a uh, with denormalization to kind of have a look end-to-end -end across the device. And there's a lot of different applications, right? So in addition to feeding a warehouse for integrated uh, reporting, kind of key business needs, there's ad hoc failure analysis by the engineers. There's batch analysis, so repeatedly looking for defects, looking for tester failures, better and better screens to identify things routinely, proactively as things are running to catch problems before they occur, you know, applications for uh, you know, powering front-end applications through services to doing you know, search lookup or you know, specific traceability, common use cases, right? So that's, that's a little bit about the overall platform. And you know, the interesting thing is just the variety of tools and use cases from packaged applications to more REST interfaces. So within that, let's look at a few examples of, of where, uh, where, where these the data handling and the, the capability of Hadoop were valuable. So here, you know, is a case where there's large volumes of binary data. And the, for warranty reasons, it need to be five years of data. That's petabytes of binary objects. It's really important, you know, as, as you can imagine, uh, engineers are working on these products, and even within a given product family, they'll make iterations and improvements on it. And they don't usually think to make sure to communicate with the downstream users of the data everything they're doing, right? So um, you'll get changes in, in the format of these binary files fairly frequently, right? And so, you know, tr having an approach where you would kind of have to parse everything up front into a schema would be incredibly frustrating. You'd have to go back and reparse things all the time and not have access to data for analytics. So instead, um, this data gets stored, you know, in schema on, in a sch with a schema on read approach and in fact have a set of pluggable decoders. So a lot of times, as you can imagine, the, the engineering teams that are building these formats 
absolutely have specialized decoding programs that they can work with it. So having a decoding system, so you have a version, metadata that has the version of the, the binary uh, data that's stored with the data, and then uh, a, a nice um, de uh, pluggable framework so that based on that version, you can use the right program to decode, which you know, is often C++. That's the language the engineers like to use in this organization, right? but adapted to, to run inside of, uh, you know, actually adapted inside of a Hive processing script. Um, makes it a lot more convenient so you can query it, you know, go, go on and query the data as you need it based on the latest version of script. If something's broken, you don't have to reload all the data, but you'd simply update the script, get the latest one that you didn't have. Right? So that, that's been really helpful to be able to get access to this raw binary data and make, make sense of it with decoding tools. You know, another thing is, as you can see, it's a little bit grayed out by this really complex wide structure. Tens of thousands of parameters get created with all these different pieces, the tests. Um, so having the ability to create this kind of, of timeline view with all the parameters over time in the structure lets the end users analyze things in a compact way. They can query it. And you know, one of the things that's also a nice uh, takeaway is that engineers tend to be great users of big data systems because they're able to deal with things like writing complex queries and, and, and analyze the data in a very precise way. But having this ability to take these wide structures and, and go from the raw event history into timeline view with more complete information about the devices that you're trying to analyze is a big win, right? So you're trying to figure out a failure on something, you can pull back the exact information and do your analysis on that or a handful of matching items. In some cases, you can do something as simple as, you know, we have Elasticsearch to do indexing. If you want to look up a given component or ID, you can pull back just that information. But often you'll see that instead it's more of the form of, well, we want to find all the matching items that have the following property, right? So you want to look over structures and filter it based on the, those, that property, then pull back a smaller number of these structures that you can then do your analysis on. Another really interesting one for, for customer was you know, a case where it really started to get into much more proactive analysis. This one actually came out of a hackathon where you know, having all the data in the data lake in a raw form let, let us collaborate with uh, some of the business users and say, well, is there a way we could do this kind of analysis, right? So th this kind of a diagram uh, was something that their engineers would spend a half a day doing for one device. They'd pull this data and painstakingly create this to try to figure out what's going wrong. And in a hackathon, we worked with them to say, how could we plot these things automatically, right? And so we were able to do it. It wasn't very efficient, done out of the, the, the raw data. So then we created a, a process to make it much more efficient, how to organize the data to do this. And suddenly, you know, they are literally able to scan hundreds of billions of test points for millions of products and identify the needle in a haystack of, here's some ones that are irregular. And they looked, and they, sure enough, they found a bug in the code that came from uh, this analysis they could never have done manually. But now having that ability, they could do this, you know, use the power of Hadoop processing to scan over large amounts of data and pull out those outliers. Uh, similar thing, they've started to get a better understanding of some of the physics and the devices because they're able to analyze millions of items that you never could do before. So really shifting the game from reactively trying to figure out why, what's wrong with this one thing to proactively looking back and say, what are root causes and, and what's fundamentally different here? So, Conclusions, you know, fundamentally, Internet of Things is about blending data. You've got a data management problem that you have all this great data, you know, sensor data and configuration data. You've got uh, data about um, software that's operating and putting it together is important. Having the right patterns and practices for working with data is foundational that then lets you get to the fun stuff, the analytics. So that's a little bit about me. Before I uh, turn it over for a few minutes of questions, uh, I've got a couple of quick commercials here. So again, at Think Big, uh, we have been doing Hadoop and more recently Spark Solutions since 2010 with services not just on implementation of data management, but analytics, managed services, architectures, and roadmaps, and we're hiring. So we're expanding quickly uh, throughout Europe. And, uh, you know, we have a large office in London, uh, here and in, in other parts in Eastern and Western Europe. Um, and then also I wanted to touch on, we announced a customer satisfaction index analytics solution, right, which is very different than Internet of Things, but, uh, you know, package solution. Uh, Teradata, our parent company, has announced here at the conference to let you 
really have analytics. So if you are interested in more behavioral insights, that's something you might want to come to the booth. In fact, both of them are good reasons to come to our booth. Um, and with that, uh, this gives us about five minutes here at the end uh, if you have any questions. All right. Well, it's hard to compete with beer. Oh, yeah, in the back. Yeah, well, here, I'll, I'll, I'll go back. There's a, a, a chart here that addresses some of them. I mean, you see, right, this was talking about how do you kind of work with, organize the data, which, you know, somewhat, how do you either land it or transform it once it's landed? Um, so if you go back to acquisition or ingestion here, right, what we see is that there tend to be different ways of pulling in data, right? So a lot of times you'll have significant amounts of data that are still available in batch feeds, right? You know, batch feeds have been the lingua franca of data movement for a long time. For, and so, you know, having ability to coordinate and orchestrate among batch feeds and have the metadata to be confident you got them all and you've organized them correctly, partitioned them is important. So are various streaming technologies, right? That a lot of times you have larger scale systems will feed in data continuously in a stream so again, being able to have you know, microservices architectures collect that, do some of the preparation, then land it completely in the right partitioned organization, again, based on the, the target data modeling you want to do is important. Um, there's also another interesting fork in the road that you know, even with all of these new data sets, often more variety, a lot of data that you also want to incorporate in your IO2 application tends to be relational. Right, so in the case study I gave you, there's hundreds of relational tables, you know, from the ERP system, from the manufacturing systems, that give you a lot of context around all that complex binary data and all the test data and, and configuration data that's not traditionally structured. So being able to collect all of that relational data is important, and, and for that, you know, a, a, a key capability is to be able to have change data capture, right, so you can systematically collect hundreds of tables in, in one go instead of having you know, hundreds of scripts running scoop or something like that one at a time collecting the data. So there's a lot to how do you have consistent patterns for acquiring the data, tying it into the, the, the metadata so you can govern it, and then being able to have orchestration tools. Right? So we, we've put together a nice tool for, for making it easy to orchestrate and collect that data and give visibility, not just at the level of a single job, but for an entire flow of, in, of ingesting and making data available for access that speaks not only to the IT operations folks, but to the data users as well. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, so, so Spark is, is being used in a number of different ways um, in, in data lakes. I mean, one is in the preparation layer, you know, increasingly we're seeing um, the engine that's doing the various computations, the transformations is going to be Spark. You know, it might be Spark SQL, it might be Spark directly. Um, so first of all, in the preparation layer. Second of all, you know, the, it's being used in the access layer. You know, for experiments, a lot of data science uses are using Spark for you know, fast iterative algorithms, you know, quick access to data, low latency. Um, there's different technologies for SQL. Some organizations are using Spark SQL, some are Presto, some Impala. So S Spark is being used in preparation and in the access layers. And then downstream, you know, in analytic products as well. So uh, you, know, you might have an algorithm that's scoring. Uh, for example, if you're doing predictive failure, right? you want to do, in your experimental environment, you want to train your model to say what features, what factors are predictive of failure. But then on a regular basis, as new data comes in, you're going to compute on the data lake data to say, well, now we're applying that model that then comes out here into a downstream environment where you know, an interactive application says, hey, this thing's likely to fail. Let's send out an alert or, or dispatch a proactive maintenance uh, crew. All right. Any, any more questions? We've got about 30 seconds left. So otherwise, uh, well, thank everybody for attending.